Well, let's turn, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Um, We're going to continue our series in the Lord's Prayer. Um, And it's it's amazing to me as as I've looked into this, as I've dug down into this and studied more, just more and more keeps popping up all the time that I'm like, wow, I never thought about that before. I never thought about that this way before, but God just keeps revealing more and more all the time. So um, how many of you have it memorized by now? Five or six of you? (laughs) All right, let's keep working on it. Kendra, you got that to put on the screen? Let's say it all together, all right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, today we're going to take that second phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now it's interesting to me as we look at the Lord's Prayer, it begins and ends with praise, but everything in between it is ask, ask. Ask. Notice it says, give us our daily bread. Forgive us. Lead us. Deliver us. So if you've got your notes, first thing I want you to write down this morning is God wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. You know, the disciple came to Jesus and he said, Lord, teach us to pray. And the Lord filled the bulk of the prayer with ask, 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 ask. You know, sometimes we um, just kind of forget to do that, don't we? Or maybe we don't ask specifically enough. I want to take you back to the time when we, when we first started the church and we, we started, we moved into this church. We were leasing this building. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. But we were leasing this building and, and um, you know, it came to our attention, the church that owned it was going to do something with it for a while. They weren't sure what they were going to do with it, but they decided they were going to, they were going to do something with it, and, and they were going to have a meeting. We knew about that they were having a meeting coming up, and so we just got together and we prayed. And we prayed, and I asked the church to pray specifically that they would give us this building. And so that's what we prayed for. And lo and behold, they had their meeting, and, and um, someone got up in the meeting and said, you know, I think we should just give them the building. And we're, we're, all, we're like, hallelujah. But they said, they'll have to pay for the land. And I'm like, God, why didn't they just give us the land? He said, well, you didn't ask. <laughs> you didn't ask. Maybe if we'd have asked for the land, too, we'd have got that, too. I don't know. But, but you know, God answers prayer. He wants, but he wants, us, he wants us to ask him. He wants us to ask him. Just a few verses, just to break, drive that point home. Uh, John fourteen thirteen, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Um, John fifteen seven, if you remain in me and my works remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. John sixteen twenty three, very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive. And your joy will be complete. Over and over and over, Jesus told his disciples, ask, 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 ask. Now, let's go back a little bit. Leading up to this prayer, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, now, don't be like the hypocrites do. Don't be like the hypocrites and don't be like the pagans do. They go out and they babble and they chant and they think because of their much repetition, they'll get what they requested. But he said... In Matthew 6, 8, it says, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. But he still wants you to ask him. Now, let's look at some very familiar verses in Matthew chapter 7, and starting in verse 7. Very familiar. Many of you could quote these verses. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Over and over again, ask, 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 and it'll be given to you. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will be, give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. He said, ask, 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 and it will be given to you. So what are we to ask for? What's the first thing he tells us that we should ask for? The next phrase is, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Now, what's he talking about when he says, thy kingdom come? Now, you know, we, the first thing that runs through my mind normally is, you know, his kingdom. We know Jesus is going to come and he's going to be here for a thousand years and reign on earth. And then there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and that's going to be God's kingdom. And we understand all that. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. My second point this morning, write this down. His kingdom is here. His kingdom is here. Um, this word come, the Greek word for that can be translated several different ways. Come, come, cometh, came, has come. It's a continuing thing. Now let me illustrate to you what I mean by his kingdom is here. Matthew four seventeen. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Mark 1, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It's here, it's near. Matthew 12, 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay? Matthew 10, 7, as you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of God has come near. And then Luke 17, when he was asked by the Pharisees, they, they, they had the same idea. When's this kingdom coming? When's God going to come? And when's, when's this Messiah going to come and he's going to reign in, on this earth? And when's this kingdom going to be set up? He answered them and he said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. Now, what's he mean by that? Now, I want you to think about it like this. Take that word kingdom, and let's split it apart. What does it really mean? It means king's dominion. King's dominion. It's where the king has dominion, okay? It's the area that is submitted to the king. Now, we in America have a hard time kind of relating to that because we're used to our democratic form of government where we we have a government elected by the people for the people we don't have a king all right and every, everybody votes but uh, <clears throat> here's how a kingdom works in a kingdom there's just one person that votes that's the king whatever he says goes whatever law he makes that's the law that you follow uh, that's a that's a kingdom that's how a kingdom works now in your life did you know there are three possible kings in your life? Three possible kings in your life. Yourself, God, and Satan. You can tell who the king of your life is by looking at who votes. Who votes? Who is your life submitted to? Your desires, God's desires, or Satan's desires? Who is your life submitted to? So when we say, thy kingdom come, we're saying, thy kingdom come, I submit myself to you. You are my king. I submit myself to you. You are, I'm submitting my will to your will. Thy kingdom come in here. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it begins, it begins in here. It begins in our thoughts, with the thoughts that you have. You know, every, every kingdom has enemies, right? Kingdoms build walls. They have armies. They have military. They have enemies to protect the kingdom, right? They have their military. <clears throat> Second Corinthians says that we are to take 
every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. How do you do that? How do you take your thoughts captive? Well, you know, the old saying, saying goes, you, can, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair, right? That's kind of the way thoughts are. You can't, sometimes you can't stop a thought from coming into your mind, but you can stop yourself from dwelling on that thought. And that's how this kingdom works. A thought comes into your head, you have to ask yourself, is that thought submitted to Christ? Or is that thought from Satan? Or is it just kind of my own made-up thing? But remember, we have our fallen, our fallen uh, sin nature that we are born with. <clears throat> so you have to take that thought captive. When that thought comes into your mind, you have to take that thought captive and replace it with script, strip, Scripture. How's this work? Let me illustrate. Someone makes a snide remark about you at work. What's the first thought that comes into your mind? Oh, I'm going to get even with that person, right? Oh, look out. You wait till the next employee evaluation comes up or whatever you do at your work. I'm going to get them. Revenge is sweet, right? And then you ask yourself, okay, where did that thought come from? What would Jesus do? Maybe you should get out your Bible and look up some verses in the Bible that say, where Jesus said, do not repay evil for evil. Where Jesus said, um, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. Where Jesus says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Oh. But see, to do that, you have to know what's in the Scripture. To take every thought captive, you have to know what's in there before you can do that. But you take those thoughts captive, you bring them into submission to the kingdom, to the king's dominion, the king's dominion. But you have to know what's in God's word and what what's God's word says. So let's, let's move on, that phrase. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Here's number three this morning. Our prayers must pass through the filter of his will. Through the filter of his will. If you want to get your prayers answered, there's a filter that they have to go through. The filter of God's will. His kingdom, not ours. His will, not ours. How do you do that? Well, Romans 12, 2 tells us, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So, what's he saying? He's saying, don't conform to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? Well, the pattern of this world is, is um, lying, cheating, stealing, greed, envy, strife, etc., you name it. That's the pattern of this world. Don't conform to that. Don't be a part of that, but be transformed. But he tells us how to be transformed. How to be transformed by the renewing of your mind is what I was just talking about, by your thought life. That's how you transform your mind, by how you think, what you think about is how you transform your mind. And then he says, then he says, you will know God's will. You will know God's will whenever you do that, whenever you get your mind transformed. And let me tell you, it's a continuing process that you go through who your whole life. I still get some thoughts in my mind that shouldn't be there, okay? And I'm sure you do too. And you have to take those thoughts captive, and you have to put them under the will of God, under the, under the submission of God. Um, <clears throat> 1 Peter 1.12 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So as a believer, your desires should be different than they were when you were, before you were a believer. You know, we're born with that sinful nature that we don't have to be taught how to have those, that, those, that sin in our life. We don't have to be taught how to have those thoughts in our life. They come naturally. See, we're, if we are praying in the flesh, we will pray my will be done. God, I want this. 
I want that. God, give me this. God, give me that. But Jesus is teaching us to pray, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Big difference. Big difference. He says, be transformed. You know, <clears throat> my six-year-old grandson is into these transformers. He's got these little toys that look like cars, right? You all have seen them. He goes flying around. All of a sudden, he picks them up, and he turns this and turns that, and all of a sudden, it's a little robot. It's totally transformed. That's kind of like God wants for you to be transformed, to transform you from what you were to what he wants to make you into being. Transform your mind, the way you think. <clears throat> Here's another verse in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. You should underline that. Contemplate means to think about, to study, uh, think profound, profoundly and at length, uh, to meditate, are being transformed into his image with ever, ever increasing glory which comes, comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It says we are being transformed. It's a continual process that goes on our whole life. See, when you contemplate on something, it's not just a fleeting thought. You're contemplating, you're studying, you're meditating, you're thinking about it a lot. You're obsessed with it. See, if we focus on God, He changes our desires. He changes our, our desires. Um... So all those verses that I read in the beginning about asking, ask this. Jesus says over and over and over, ask this, ask this, and you'll receive it. Ask this, and you'll receive it. Come to, come to God and ask, ask, ask. All those have to pass through the filter of his will. Fourth thing, just his will is best. His will is best. Acts 13, 36 says, For after David had gone, done the will of God, in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. It says, David did the will of God. David served the will of God. Isn't that what God wants us to do? He wants us to serve his will. He wants us to do his will. Will somebody be able to say that about you at the end of your life? So-and-so did the will of God. Did the will of God. Well, how do you know what God's will is? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We know it's God's will that we are thankful, right? We know that it is. <clears throat> so, how do we do that? <clears throat> John 7.17 7, Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. <clears throat> okay? Jesus is saying, if you, really, if you really test me, if you really test the will of God, you will know my teaching is from God. Um, so we pray, thy will be done. We're praying, God, your will is way above my will. Let's look at the best example that we have of this. Jesus Christ himself. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? When Jesus was praying and he prayed, he knew what was coming up. He knew that he was on a course to the cross. He knew the soldiers were coming. He knew he'd been betrayed. He knew his time was up. And he still prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was saying, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to go through with this. But he had submitted his will to the king's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, was what he was saying. You know, there come those times in your life when you're, you'll face some hard choices. You know what you want to do, um, and you know what you should do. You know what you would like to do in your own flesh, what, what you want to do, but you know what God's choice would be. You know what God wants you to do. I've had those times in my life, and I'm sure you have too. See, it all comes down to choices, making the right choice. 
Sometimes I've made the right choice. Sometimes I've made the wrong choice. And I'm sure you have too. Let, let me illustrate one of those. As I think back again to starting this church in 2005, for about a year, God had been stirring in my spirit that, you know, you need to do something. And I kept saying, no, no, I'm, I, I, I didn't want to start a church. I didn't I wanted nothing to do with it. And it just kept coming back over and over and over again. And, and <clears throat> so finally I said, okay, okay, we'll take the plunge and we'll do it. And I, to be honest with you, you know, I looked at myself, I looked at my abilities and I said, yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, but all right, we'll take the plunge. And now I look back and I say, God's will is best. See, I said, okay, God, it's your will and not mine. See, this isn't my church. This is God's church. Some of you wouldn't be in a church if it weren't for this church. Some of you wouldn't be saved if it weren't for this church. Because of our affiliation with Unshackled TV, there are people all over the world who have been saved because of that decision. Because of this church, over a thousand kids in Nicaragua have a place to go to hear the gospel because of this church. Wow, God, your will is best. Your will is Remember that the next time you're faced with a decision. You know what you want to do. You know what your will is. You also know what God's will is. Which choice are you going to make? Which choice are you going to make? And then we come with the last phrase, in earth as it is in heaven. The king's dominion brings heaven to earth. The king's do we pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, how is it in heaven? How is it in heaven? Well, let me show you how it is in heaven. One verse in Revelation 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Think about that a little bit. We're praying that on earth it would be like it, like it is in heaven, a little bit of heaven here on earth. You can have a little bit of heaven here on earth. One of those is the sting of death is gone. Yeah, we're still going to have trouble. We're still going to have sickness. We're still going to have pain and suffering. We're going we're gonna to all go die someday. But that sting of death is gone. I've officiated a lot of funerals over the years. And uh, most of them were someone that I knew. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt where they were headed. I knew that without a shadow of doubt that they were a follower of Jesus Christ. For many who had suffered for a period of time through illness and, and what have you, um, <clears throat> death had become a welcoming thing instead of something to fear. It became a door to the next life instead of something that they feared. It was uh, because they had submitted their lives to the kingdom of God here. Going through that door was just passing into his kingdom even more. But there were a few that I wasn't so sure about. There were a few that I couldn't honestly stand up and say that I knew where their soul had gone. Had it gone to be with Jesus in eternity or had it gone to hell prepared for Satan and his demons? There were a few, I sadly have to say, that I wasn't sure about. When you're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What you're really praying is, God, I want that little bit of heaven here on earth. I want, I want that, I want that sting of death gone. And even more than that, you know, he promises, he promises you peace that passes all understanding. He promises you a joy unspeakable and full of glory. He promises you a love that is unmatched by anything that man can come up with. God promises you that little bit of heaven here on earth. I want to ask you this morning, do you have that? 
Do you have that little bit of heaven in your heart today? You can have that little bit of heaven in your heart today. Um, <clears throat> as we stand, let us stand as we pray this morning. I want, I want to just ask you, is your life submitted to the king's dominion today? I, I just want to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart today. Is your life submitted to the king's dominion? Or is there some other dominion that's still uh, in control over your life? Is it uh, maybe yourself, your own, your own thing? I'm going to do it my way. I don't need God. I don't need to be submitted to him. I can make my own decisions. Or is it, is it even worse than that? Is it Satan who's guiding you, who's, who's um, directing your life today? Which king am I serving today? Is it God or is it Satan? Father, I just come to you. God, I thank you today that we can come to you and you, you promise us so many things. You promise us that if we come and we ask that we will receive. And the biggest thing you promise to give us if we come and ask is that um, to have our sins forgiven, that you will forgive. You promise without a shadow of doubt you will forgive and, and we'll be a part of that kingdom, your kingdom. Um, God, I pray that um, if there's anybody here that hasn't done that yet, that they do that this morning. Just uh, submit their lives to your dominion, to your kingdom. Father, I just uh, lift these wonderful people up to you. I pray that you would guide and direct us as we go throughout this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.